Hey, what is going on, everybody? Nick Heron here with Fantasy Football Facts. Guys, this is my personal ranking video for the running backs in 2018. Um, guys, if you like this video, make sure that you drop a like on it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'm going to be doing every position here. So, well, the main positions anyway. Quarterback, wide receiver, uh, running back today, and obviously tight end as well. We're not going to do kickers and defenses because... You really should just be playing matchups with defenses and kickers like anybody knows. Honestly, like anybody knows. So, uh, anyway, guys, like I said, today we're going to be doing the top 50 running backs. And, uh, again, if you guys are enjoying this, make sure you drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. So, uh, with that said, also, I'm going to leave a link to my full rankings uh, list in the description of this video. So, if you guys are enjoying it. Um, if you enjoy the, the rankings for the running backs, I have all the other positions down there as well. This is PPR only. So, uh, you know, obviously if you play in non-PPR leagues, you're probably playing on an old platform if you're playing in uh, non-PPR. I think Yahoo has moved to half PPR. ESPN, I believe, has moved to full PPR this year. So every league that you're playing in, for the most part, if you're starting up new leagues, is going to be PPR. So just as a standard, we're going to be going forward with PPR. If there are specific cases where guys are specifically not good for PPR, I will try to mention that. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, guys, that uh, this rankings list is for PPR. So if you're playing non-PPR, it might be slightly different, but I, at least for running backs, um, most of them are going to be, you know, not great receivers anyway. So uh, with that said, let's get into the top 50 guys, and we're going to start off at number 50 with Baltimore's Kenneth Dixon. Now, Kenneth Dixon is a guy who a lot of people believe could potentially overtake that backfield in favor of uh, Alex Collins. So, you know, he's somebody that you want to keep on your radar anyway. I don't necessarily know that he's a must draft or anything like that, but he's somebody that I like at the end of drafts, just as kind of a flyer pick. If Alex Collins does go down or if he's not performing, they might give Kenneth Dixon a chance. Um, he's had some suspension issues. He also had a uh, uh, an injury that kept him out. So, you know, the team really hasn't ha had a great opportunity to see just how good he is. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Next up, we have a rookie running back for the Cleveland Browns, Nick Chubb. Now, Nick Chubb is currently behind Carlos Hyde on the depth chart, so there is a little bit of concern to be had there. Um, he is kind of a similar style runner to, to Carlos Hyde, but maybe more physically talented than Carlos Hyde. A lot of people don't realize this, but he was kind of Saquon Barkley before Saquon Barkley was Saquon Barkley as far as prospect rankings go. So uh, he's certainly a guy that has the physical talent. The injury concern is there for Nick Chubb, and the other concern obviously is that uh, Carlos Hyde's ahead of him on the depth chart currently. Duke Johnson's kind of entrenched as a wide as the receiving back so the question is how many carries is he really going to get but if Carlos Hyde does go down this is a potentially really good offense this year at least in terms of physical talent so you might be in a good situation if you do draft Nick Chubb late in the in your draft uh, up next at number 48 we have Bilal Powell now Bilal Powell is a guy that a lot of people think might start the season as the running back uh, the starting running back in New York the team did draft, or not draft, but they brought in Isaiah Crowell. So, um, you know, obviously he is somebody that they have some sort of plans for, but we don't really know for sure exactly what's going to happen with that. Uh, Bilal Powell is a better receiver than Isaiah Crowell is. So, you know, that's a big advantage that he does have. But we've kind of seen that the coaching staff there in New York doesn't want to give Bilal Powell a full workload. So that's why he's not higher on my list, even though, like I said, there's a possibility that he does start the season as the starter. Moving forward to number 47, C.J. Anderson, now of the Carolina Panthers. Um, C.J. Anderson is a guy that Denver got rid of, but he did actually perform fairly well for them. And I, I think, honestly, he steps in as a good kind of complementary piece for what they have going on there with Christian McCaffrey. Um, C.J. Anderson's more of a between-the-tackles type of grinder. He's not a big play guy, but he is somebody that does have the capability to break long runs. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen that in a long time. Now, the one thing about C.J. Anderson is that people seem to think that he's going to step in and be the goal line back in Carolina, but nobody's the goal line back in Carolina. The goal line back is Cam Newton, and that's not going to change. So if you're expecting 10 touchdowns out of C.J. Anderson, I think that you want to look elsewhere. Uh, I just don't think that's a likely thing to happen. However, if Christian McCaffrey does get injured, C.J. Anderson's a guy that could step in and potentially benefit from being that, in that same backfield as Cam Newton. Uh, defenses have to key in on Cam Newton on the run, and that makes things very difficult for whoever is trying to defend them. Um, and, and so, on, honestly, I'm not huge on C.J. Anderson, but I'm somebody who thinks that he does have value, number one, as a handcuff, and then number two, you know, in some cases, there could be situations where he does get 10, 15 carries in a game, and that does obviously have some value. 
So up next, Theo Riddick of the Detroit Lions. He has a role established in this Detroit backfield, but it is minimal. Um, you know, he's a guy that's probably going to get four or five catches a game. Uh, and obviously that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add that up over the course of a season, you're talking about 70, 80 catches on the year. So that's something that does have some value if he stays healthy. The concern obviously is that Theo Riddick has suffered from injuries and, you know, that backfield did add another piece, a couple new pieces this off season. So, um, you know, there's, there is some concern that he just doesn't have very high ceiling. His floor is decent right now, so if you're somebody that completely misses out on running backs and you end up being in a desperate situation, Theo Reddick's probably going to be there on a lot of waiver wires, and he's somebody that you could add kind of as a, a last-minute replacement, kind of regardless of matchup, so that's always nice as well. So number 45, I do have Isaiah Crowell of the New York Jets. We talked about him a few moments ago when we talked about Bilal Powell. I think that Isaiah Crowell is probably going to end up being the better player to own in this backfield, but honestly... I'm not sure that either of them is necessarily that great of a value, to be completely honest with you, because they're probably going to steal a lot of touches from one another. It's going to be kind of similar almost to maybe how the Duke Johnson and Isaiah Crowell backfield was in Cleveland last year, where Isaiah Crowell did get some decent carries, but, you know, it wasn't a good offense at all. Uh, and same thing with New York this year. There's, there's a real possibility that they have the worst offense in the league this season. So getting running backs in that type of situation is not typically very good. Uh, but if you're somebody who, again, is desperate at running back, I think that Isaiah Crowell might get you know 10 to 12 touches a game. So there is value in that still, even though it's probably not going to be substantially uh, you know fantasy relevant in, in a lot of weeks anyway. Um, I think that he does have kind of RB2 upside, low-end RB2 upside, if everything goes well for him. But his downside is basically not a fantasy relevant player, even though he's starting. So, you know, eh. You just kind of have to weigh your options a lot of times at this point. You're talking about running backs that are ranked in the 40s. So, you know, they're RB4s for most people, RB3s at the best. Um, and uh, some, some people are going to have these guys as RB5s on their team if they're smart. So moving forward, number 44, Jordan Wilkins. This is a running back that the Indianapolis Colts drafted this season, mid-round draft pick. Um, so he's not a guy that they invested a lot into. However, he's the guy that's getting a lot of touches right now with Robert Turbin being suspended uh, in, in the preseason. Uh, so, well, in the, in the early part of the season, I should say. Uh, so he's not going to be in there to start at the beginning of the season. Marlon Mack suffering from injuries. There are a lot of potential problems with Naheem Hines because he's fumbling like crazy in the preseason. So right now that kind of leaves Jordan Wilkins as the guy. Um, obviously, we don't know for certain that he's going to be that guy, but we do know that with Marlon Mack potentially being hurt to start the season, somebody's got to get some carries in this Andrew Luck backfield. So I think that I like Jordan Wilkins here. Um, I'm not sure that he's necessarily the most talented guy in this backfield. I do think that that's Marlon Mack. Uh, we'll talk about him in just a moment, but you know, Wilkins does have some upside. If he performs early in the year and Mack doesn't come back right away, Robert Turbin's, you know, an older guy that we've kind of seen, he doesn't really have a whole lot going on. Um, Jordan Wilkins has the chance to potentially win some significant touches in this backfield early in the season. So keep your eye on him early in the year. 43, Giovanni Bernard. He has standalone PPR value because he does catch a lot of passes. I also think he's one of the best possible handcuff backs in the league. This is a guy that has RB1, low-end RB1, but RB1 upside if Joe Mixon does go down. So keep that in mind, guys. Um, you could definitely do worse late in the draft than Giovanni Bernard. Um, there are a lot of guys being drafted behind him, or excuse me, ahead of him, that I don't think have the same upside that he does. So, you know, look into him anyway. I think late in your draft, he's a good option. Number 42, Marlon Mack. Uh, we talked about him just a few moments ago. I think Marlon Mack is the most talented player in this backfield, but he has so many injury concerns, and he just wasn't all that productive last year when he was given the chance. Now, granted, it was a bad offense last year, and Andrew Luck is certainly going to make that offense better, but I just don't necessarily think that uh, we should completely give up on Marlon Mack. Uh, at the same time, though, there are concerns, so, you know, just try and balance that as much as you can. Don't you know, rely on him to be your early season starter, but he's a guy I think that has the possibility of being a pretty good fantasy back if all things go well for him this season. At number 41, another guy that has some serious upside but also some serious concerns, Aaron Jones. He's going to miss the first two weeks of the season for Green Bay due to suspension. Now, Aaron Jones was by far the team's most effective running back on a per-carry basis in 2017. However, 
A lot of that, I think, had to do with the fact that he got more of his opportunity playing with Aaron Rodgers, whereas Jamal Williams had to play without Aaron Rodgers in a lot of cases. So there is a big difference there, guys. Uh, I think you're comparing apples to oranges when you're talking about the yards per carry for those guys. Um, and on, honestly, Jamal Williams right now looks like the better option. But at the same time, I think Aaron Jones has a higher upside. So the downside with Aaron Jones is that he really doesn't touch the ball hardly at all on a week-to-week -week basis. The upside is that, you know, Jamal Williams just doesn't perform. Ty Montgomery is just kind of what he is. And uh, Aaron Jones has that explosive ability. So it sucks that he kind of starts the season on a suspended list due to a PED use. Um, but, you know, if, if he does get on the field and he does perform, I think he has some serious upside here to potentially be a low-end RB2, depending on how things break, especially if Jamal Williams gets hurt. Number 40, we have Peyton Barber of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he, I think, is going to start the season as the running back one in Tampa Bay. I do have him technically ranked behind Ronald Jones because I think Ronald Jones has more upside. Peyton Barber, though, I think is certainly the safer play. Uh, if you're looking for somebody to be your starter early in the season, if you, for example, draft Mark Ingram early in the year, or early in your draft, excuse me, and you need someone early in the year, I think he's a good complement to a guy like Mark Ingram because you're going to get those first few games where he's going to have the opportunity to get some good carries, and then obviously you can pivot over to Mark Ingram if he doesn't perform to the level that we're hoping that he will. Um, he continues to move up my draft board right now because, honestly, Ronald Jones has not looked good in the preseason. So uh, I think the, the gap has certainly shrunk between those two players. Early in the season, you had uh, Peyton Barber and uh, Ronald Jones probably four or five rounds difference between them. Now I think you could honestly make the case to draft Peyton Barber ahead of Ronald Jones. So, uh, you know, there is some fantasy upside for Peyton Barber if he does end up keeping that job. But I think for the most part, it's probably going to be a split backfield this season. One thing to note is that Charles Sims was placed on IR today. So, uh, you know, that does take a little bit of uh, the backfield potential concern away. Charles Sims was probably going to be their primary pass catching running back. And I'm not sure Peyton Barber or Ronald Jones is necessarily built to do that. But at the same time, just not having that built in uh, player who knows the offense that's a good receiver in the backfield uh, to take touches away from them, to take snaps away from these guys, I think that's a good thing for their fantasy upside, even though it's a bad thing for Tampa Bay overall. At number 39, we have another guy who's been basically named the team starter, and that's Chris Carson of the Seattle Seahawks. Now, I am way lower on Chris Carson than the consensus. I realize that, okay? Uh, and I think the reason for that is because I saw Chris Carson play last year, and yes, Chris Carson was the best back of a bad backfield in Seattle last year. And because that backfield was bad, they went out and drafted a running back in the first round. This is, in my opinion, a pretty obvious case for not drafting Chris Carson as your starting running back on your fantasy team. I don't think that he's going to remain the starter in Seattle. I don't think he has special ability. I don't think he's bad. I just don't think I see anything in him that makes me say, this guy is guaranteed to be the starting running back for Seattle this season all year. I just don't see it. Um, I think Ronald Jones is... Or not Ronald Jones, excuse me. Um, I, I think Rashad Penny, excuse me, is is by far the more talented back in this backfield uh, as far as physical ability goes. So that's where I'm leaning, and we'll talk about uh, Rashad Penny in just a moment. But that's why I'm a little bit lower on Chris Carson. However, just like Peyton Barber, he is expected to start the season as the team's quote unquote starting running back, and I do expect him to get more carries than Penny to start the season. So you know, this is a potential high sell high type of situation. If he does get a lot of carries early and he performs well, make sure that you sell on him early this season. Uh, 38, I do have Jamal Williams. I mentioned before that he is the starting running back right now, essentially already named the starter, just not officially by the Green Bay backfield or the Green Bay coaches in that backfield. Um, so you know, he is somebody I think that has some pretty good upside here, especially early in the season right now when we don't necessarily have a good case of what's going to happen for the rest of the season, at least for the first couple of se couple of weeks, I do think that, uh, that you're going to get some pretty good opportunities for Jamal Williams to perform. Um, unfortunately, the Packers do have somewhat of a difficult schedule to start the season, so there is a little bit of concern there, but at the same time, I do like John, John, um, I, I do like our guy Jamal Williams here, so if, if he is able to get into the end zone a couple of times early in the year, there could be a case that he is one of those guys who just performs all season as the Green Bay backfield uh, leader. And, and honestly, having the guy that's the best running back in a good offense like this would be very, very valuable. 
I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Like I mentioned, I think Aaron Jones is the more talented player of these guys. But right now, the Green Bay coaching staff, I think, trusts Jamal Williams the most. So that's, that's who we've got here up at 38. At number 37, we have James White. And I think the big thing here is that we don't know necessarily what the health is of the other players in this backfield right now. Um, James White's a guy that does know this offense. He's been in it for a long time. Sonny Michelle's banged up. Rex Burkhead is banged up. And honestly, the big guy is James White. I mean, he could catch five to eight passes a week early in the season. And he's a guy that does have PPR value even beyond that. Three, four, five, six catches a week, I think, for James White all year is a pretty likely outcome. And if he's catching five passes a week for 40 yards, that's nine points in a, in a PPR. That's a decent floor, honestly. It really is. Um, and, and honestly, if you look at the potential of a touchdown coming out of that, the ceiling isn't great for James White because I don't think he's an every down back, but the floor is actually pretty decent if these other guys aren't completely healthy. So especially while Sony Michelle's hurt, if he does miss time this, this year early in the season, I like James White. Moving forward at 36, we do have another pass catching back, and that is Tariq Cohen of the Chicago Bears. Now, Tariq Cohen, I think, was very underutilized last season, but I think that the new coaching staff there does have a good possibility of actually using him pretty decently. So uh, if we do get some uh, pass catching opportunities for Tariq Cohen, I think he could perform as a decent running back three here in fantasy in 2018. I'm not entirely convinced that's going to happen, though. So that's why I've got him down here at 36. That's probably pretty close to his average draft position in most for, in, in most websites. But, um, you know, I do like him. I think that he has a good possibility of doing some good things. But he is pretty small. He's not going to overtake uh, Jordan Howard as, like, the bell cow back or anything like that. But he does have some of that Duke Johnson type upside. At number 35, we have Ronald Jones. I talked about him a little bit ago. Uh, I just don't think that the talent is necessarily there with this guy. I, I didn't see it on tape when I looked at him. Uh, and the analytics are not necessarily in his favor either. And he hasn't performed well early in the preseason. Now, it's not necessarily the kiss of death or anything like that. But it is a little bit concerning that he hasn't run away with this job. Peyton Barber is not a superstar talent at running back. So, uh, you know, he's somebody that they invested a pretty significant draft capital in. And he hasn't performed yet. He's not going to be the starter to start the season unless something happens to Peyton Barber. So he's a guy that you don't want to start early in your fantasy season. And you kind of have to draft him pretty early right now. Uh, in most websites, he's going still as a low-end uh, RB2 or a high-end RB3. So, you know, you've got to keep that in mind if you're drafting him. It, you're going to have to hold on to him. And I'm not sure that I'm necessarily too excited about doing that because I'm not sure that the talent is necessarily there yet. At number 34, I have Ty Montgomery. Now, this is kind of surprising. I think most people would put Ty Montgomery as the third back in this backfield. But to me, he's the guy that has the most solidified role. I think he's basically the Duke Johnson of this backfield. If you want to compare Aaron Jones to uh, you know Nick Chubb and Jamal Williams to Carlos Hyde, kind of, I guess, if you're going to make a comparison. I think Ty Montgomery has by far the best pass-catching ability. He's a former wide receiver, obviously. And in a PPR format, that does have value. He's the only guy in this offense that has multiple years of experience in it as well. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, he does have some deficiencies as a pass blocker. He's not a great between the tackles runner. But as a pass catcher, he does have the talent. So I like that about him. I'm not sure necessarily that he is going to be a guy that's going to be a consistent producer. But he does have like 60, 70 catch upside. And that's pretty good at a running back position at this point. At number 33, it is Duke Johnson, the guy that I just compared Ty Montgomery to. Um, Duke Johnson, I think, is one of the best zero RB targets in this draft uh, in, in 2018. And, and honestly, like if you're looking at, let's say you draft a wide receiver in the first round and a wide receiver in the second round and maybe a tight end in the third round and um, maybe you get your first running back there in the fourth round or, or maybe even you get Aaron Rodgers in the fourth round or something along those lines and you're desperate at running back in the middle rounds, Duke Johnson's a good option because he's somebody that puts up consistent points. He's not going to lose catches to Nick Chubb or Carlos Hyde. Now, granted, Carlos Hyde had good receptions last year, but on a per-catch basis, he was very, very inefficient. Um, we kind of look favorably upon just catches versus actually looking at how productive the player was with the catches. And again, Carlos Hyde was pretty good last year in catches, but you don't want to compare that to Duke Johnson's numbers. Trust me, Duke Johnson has almost double the yards per reception uh, as uh, Carlos Hyde. And obviously, I think the Browns realized that. They did re-sign him this year, kept him as a, as a Cleveland Brown. 
I didn't love that because I wanted to see Duke Johnson get another opportunity on another team where he's maybe going to get utilized a little bit more uh, and have a little higher upside. But I still think Duke has about the same upside that he did last year. And he was a pretty good fantasy running back and a guy that you could rely on on a week-to-week -week basis just because he catches so many passes. He even plays out of the slot. I don't think he's going to do that quite as much now that Jarvis Landry's there in Cleveland. But at the same time, he is still a pretty good value, in my opinion, out of the backfield. At number 32, we do have the last member of this Cleveland backfield, and that is Carlos Hyde. So we've got them pretty close to one another, you can see on the list. Um, and Carlos Hyde at 32, I think he's looked pretty good in the preseason. Um, obviously, he was very good last year. He was a top 12 running back in 2017. Uh, I just got done mentioning that I think his pass catching ability is a little bit overrated based on what he did last year. But at the same time, I still think he can catch some passes. And I think he's going to be the ball carrier that's going to have the most carries in this backfield on the season. I think he's probably going to be their goal line back, and there is some value in that. So I don't love him, but at the same time, I'm not a hater on Carlos Hyde either. I, I have him ranked highest in this Cleveland backfield, even though I actually think he's the least talented back in this backfield, as crazy as that sounds. just It's just situation sometimes, guys, over, over talent. And I, I hate to say that, but that's just the way that it goes sometimes. Now, down at 31, I do have Sony Michelle, the rookie running back of the New England Patriots. He is injured, but he should get a chance eventually to play this season. And I think when he does get that opportunity, he is going to look pretty good. Um, I'm not sure that he's going to overtake Rex Burkhead as like an every down back, and I'm not sure he's going to take all the pass receptions from James White. However, at the same time, New England has shown before that they can make multiple running backs fantasy relevant, and I think that's going to happen this year. They invested an early pick on Sony Michelle. I don't think they want to throw that away. I think that Sony Michelle is going to be involved in this offense, and I would be very, very surprised if he's not somebody that is fantasy relevant this season. He's not somebody you want to use early in the season. We want to make sure that he does get the touches before we're actually inserting him into our lineup. But once he does, it's all systems go. Get him in your lineup because that guy has talent. Number 30, Tevin Coleman. I think he's probably the premier handcuff in all of fantasy football. Uh, we say it every year. If Devonta Freeman goes down, Tevin Coleman is going to be a potential top 12 running back. And that means he's an RB1. And I still believe that's true. Um, I do think this is going to be his last season in Atlanta as well. So there's something to be kind of extrapolated from that, guys. They're going to want to actually get some carries out of him, in my opinion, because basically once he's gone, they're not going to have any chance to get any more carries out of him, obviously. And uh, it, it's kind of one of those things where if you know that the, your asset is going to be no longer usable for you, why would you save him kind of a thing? I think he's going to get more touches this season than he did last year. Um, I still think Devonta Freeman is going to be fine, but I do expect that Tevin Coleman is going to touch the ball more this season overall. He'll probably be less efficient on a per-touch basis just because, I mean, that dude's got some crazy long plays that are just not sustainable. But at the same time, I do think that he has some value here. Uh, standalone value in a PPR, he does catch some passes. And also, like I said, he has great upside if Devonta Freeman were to go down. Now at 29, I do have Rex Burkhead as the highest ranked New England running back. I expect him to be their goal line back. I expect him to be basically their, their best running back. I expect him to be kind of the Deion Lewis of this year, where he's going to be a guy that you can rely on on a week-to-week -week basis. Now I'm not expecting necessarily to score as many points as Deion Lewis did, but at the same time, you don't have to invest a huge draft capital into him at this point. Sonny Michelle's still going ahead of him in a lot of drafts, and I think that Rex Burkhead's the better player of the two for this season, just because Sony Michelle, I think, is going to miss some time early in the year. We do have some concern about Rex Burkhead's knee. There is some sort of a, a slight terror. Like, I, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I don't know the medical definitions, but there is some concern about that. Uh, however, they are saying that they expect him to be ready for week one, and it's not something they're overly concerned about. But to me, I, I'm not super convinced that he is going to be the every down back. I know there are a lot of people that are basically banking their season on Rex Burkhead. I'm not one of those people, but I would take him as an RB3 pretty easily or you know potentially as an RB2, a low-end RB2, uh, if I'm pretty desperate at the running back position. Now at number 28, I have Rashad Penny of the Seattle Seahawks. I mentioned before, I think he's pretty clearly the more talented player out of this backfield. Um, we did lose uh, J.D. McKissick to an injury. Uh, early in this preseason. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be out all season or anything, but the pass catching work is probably going to go to CJ Procise. But at the same time, we're really focused on just kind of that every down work. And I, I don't think that Chris Carson is the guy in this backfield. Uh, maybe early in the season, like I said, but over the course of the season, they drafted this guy in the first round. Seattle did. 
Okay. Now, Seattle is a team that says we're going to play the guys that are playing the best, basically. They're not going to be concerned about draft capital, yada, yada, yada. But I don't believe that. Okay. This is a team that drafted a position that you just don't necessarily have to invest high draft capital in. Uh, and they did it to get Rashad Penny. They, they want this guy. They're excited about him, and I think that, yes, maybe he's been a little bit disappointing in the preseason, but at the same time, I still think over the course of the season, he's going to pan out, and he's going to be a very good fantasy back. on Johnson at 27 of the Detroit Lions, another rookie running back. This is a guy who I think has the best opportunity to get the most touches in this backfield. Um, the talent isn't necessarily super high with him. I wouldn't put him in the same conversation as uh, Rashad Penny or Sony Michel or Nick Chubb, or obviously Saquon Barkley, but I think he's on that like second, third tier of running backs, um, and I think the opportunity is going to be pretty good for him. So I like that. Detroit's offense should be pretty solid. So, uh, you know, I'm not overly concerned about guys like LeCarrette Blunt, and I'm not concerned about Amir Abdullah, and Theo Riddick's got, like I said, his role, but they're looking for an every down back, and I think on Johnson has a chance to be that this season for the Detroit Lions. At 28, or 26, excuse me, Derrick Henry is, uh, you know, he's just a monster. I mean, this is a guy who's a physical beast. However, I'm a little bit concerned that there just hasn't been an opportunity for him to be in every down back. And I'm sure that's because he just isn't a very good pass catcher. So the team did bring in Deion Lewis. And obviously there's going to be, you know, a little bit of controversy about which player to take first. I think in a PPR, I, I do, like I said, uh, have Derrick Henry ranked below Deion Lewis, but as you can see, I have Deion Lewis ranked at 24. So they're very, very close to one another. And in a non PPR, I do have Derrick Henry ahead of Deion Lewis. Um, so you know, again, they're they're very close to one another. We don't know. We have we really don't have a great grasp on this backfield right now. So uh, to me, I think I'm probably going to bank on the guy that's more likely to catch passes, just because I, I think that role is something that Derrick Henry doesn't necessarily have the physical ability to do. Uh, at least not to the extent of Deion Lewis. So that's why I've got Deion Lewis ranked a little higher. But, you know, both of these guys should be good. The Tennessee offense should be pretty valuable this season for fantasy production. Um, they have new coaches there. And I think that it's going to be an improvement. Uh, I don't see any way that they're as bad as they were last year offensively. And I think that's going to help this entire backfield. Number 25, Chris Thompson. Now, uh, Chris Thompson is the only Washington running back that I have ranked in my top 50. So they added Adrian Peterson. They've got, uh, they've got Rob Kelly, they've got Samaj P. Ryan, but Chris Thompson is the only guy that I am ranking in my top 50, and that's just because I think he's the only guy that has a built-in guaranteed role. Um, the only concern with Chris Thompson that I have right now is that he's still talking about being hurt. Um, this is a guy who suffered a torn ACL in 2017, and that ended his season, obviously, so we're concerned about that coming into 2018. This is a guy who is himself mentioned that he's not 100% and he probably won't be until November. Anytime that a player is coming out and saying that, I'm concerned. So I'm not drafting Chris Thompson as high as some other people are. I don't think that, you know, the, the injury to Darius Geis really even changed Chris Thompson's upside all that much, to be completely honest with you. So uh, I had Chris Thompson ranked like, what, 30th probably? So I moved him up five spots, which is, you know, it's a decent move up, but it's not like I moved him up to being an RB1 or anything like that just because Darius Geis went out. I, I still think that he's basically what he is. I don't think his role in the offense changes all that much now. Um, and again, the injury concern is there. Moving up to number 23, we talked about 24 being Deion Lewis. 23, Lamar Miller of the Houston Texans. Um, Deontay Foreman is likely to start the season on the pup. So basically, Lamar Miller doesn't have any competition in this backfield. And if he doesn't have competition in the backfield, Deshaun Watson's going to be the running back or the quarterback. I think you want to be the running back in that type of a backfield. There's there's a lot of upside when your quarterback is mobile, and the offense should be better than it was last year overall. And Lamar Miller was good when when uh, Deshaun Watson was in in 2017. So I don't see any reason why that won't continue. He's not a stud running back or anything like that, but you don't have to pay for that anymore. Lamar Miller was an RB one two seasons ago, or even last year in some leagues. But going into this season, you're barely paying RB2, if you are at all. There are a lot of leagues where he's going to slip almost into the 30s at running back, and I think that there's great value to be had there. He's going to get touches, and he's going to be somebody that you can rely on at least early in the season. So I, I think Lamar Miller's good value, and like I said, he's the type of guy that you can compliment like a, a Mark Ingram with if you want to, or uh, maybe another guy that you're wanting to wait on, like a Sony Michelle or um, one of these other running backs. Um, 
let's see here, like a Rashad Penny, for example. You draft him. You also draft a Lamar Miller so that you can play Lamar Miller early in the season. And then once Rashad Penny fully gets into that offense, then you can kind of make that transition if you want to, if you're not seeing what you like out of Lamar Miller. Or then at that point, by that by the time he gets onto the field, uh, Penny by the time he takes over that job in Seattle like I expect him to, then you can decide if you want to move Lamar Miller or Rashad Penny at that point. So it gives you more options. And I think there's there's value in guys like this who are going to start the season as the running back in their, in their offense and really don't have any competition. So uh, there's another guy here on this list that I, that I kind of feel the same way about, and that's Marshawn Lynch at 21. Uh, we're going to skip over 22 for now. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to it. But Marshawn Lynch, I think, is a guy that really doesn't have much competition. A lot of people think that Doug Martin's going to get a lot of carries. I don't see it. I think Marshawn Lynch was effective last year, and, and his counting stats weren't very good. But if you actually go back and watch the film, this guy ran really, really well, all things considered, last year in what was not a good offense. Uh, John Gruden's the kind of guy that gets his bell cow running back, and he gives him the ball, and he gives him the ball, and he gives him the ball. And I don't expect that to change. I think Marshawn Lynch is going to be that guy. I think he has RB1 upside this season. I really do. Now, when I say that, I mean like RB10 to 12, and more likely probably 12 to 15 uh, upside. But at the same time, I think his downside is like 24th to be honest with you, if he stays healthy. So I think Marshawn Lynch is a very good value where he's currently going in drafts. Now, number 22, we talked about uh, skipping over, but Mark Ingram of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, a lot of people have him ranked higher than this. I have a little bit of concern right now. I've thought more about this, and uh, I think that I have a little bit of concern about the possibility of him not necessarily getting the type of workload that he got last year once he gets onto the field. So he is going to be suspended for the first four games of the season, if you didn't know that, uh, due to a PED suspension. But uh, Alvin Kamara, if he comes out and he performs like the way that a lot of people think he's going to, there's a possibility that Mark Ingram just does not get enough carries to be super fantasy relevant. Um, you know, he's not the greatest pass catcher. He's a good pass catcher, but he's not somebody that just has that role that he's just going to steal that away from Alvin Kamara or anything. So where does he step in if Alvin Kamara performs between the tackles and he's a good, on a per carry basis, running back? I think Mark Ingram might be in a situation where he's getting six to ten carries and maybe two to three receptions. And yeah, there's value in that, especially if he ends up being the goal line back. Uh, but I think Alvin Kamara could potentially take enough work for him to make him kind of a guy that you're not super excited about starting, at least not until like mid-season when he finally gets back into the swing of things uh, and starts rolling in that offense again. So again, there is some concern about this with Mark Ingram. Don't necessarily draft him as an RB2 guarantee. And I, I think a lot of people talking about him still having RB1 upside, I think that's kind of pie in the sky. He did it last year. They both did it last year, but I don't see that happening again. The, it, like, the touchdown production out of this backfield in 2017 was insane, and it's unsustainable, in my opinion, with Drew Brees at quarterback. If they score that many rushing touchdowns again, I will eat my hat. Like, <laughs> I just don't see that happening. I do not think that's going to happen. So let's move on to number 20, and that is LaShawn McCoy. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. When I heard the, the news that that whole story came out where he had allegedly abused his ex-girlfriend... I was pretty concerned that he was not going to play this season, but nothing seems to be coming of it. Now, there still could be something that comes of it, and there is concern about that, but as of right now, I basically think that we have to draft him like he's not going to miss any time. Like, it, it's it's a really weird situation right now. I, like, I, I want to build in him missing some games, but at the same time, we're not seeing that happening. So it's a really, really weird situation. It's very similar to what happened with Ezekiel Elliott last year. Uh, where we think that he has a possibility of completely skipping, missing any time. But at the same time, in the back of our head, we're telling ourselves there's a real possibility that he might. So I I'm not sure what to tell you about this. But one thing I will tell you is that the Buffalo offense might be the worst in the league. So even if LaShawn McCoy does play every game this season, I don't see him having RB1 upside anymore. And I think his downside is that he doesn't play this season. So to me, I think putting him at RB20 is actually probably a little bit nice of me. A lot of people have him ranked lower than that, and there are a lot of people that will absolutely flat out refuse to draft LaShawn McCoy based on the allegations, and I don't necessarily blame you on that, but if you are looking to win your fantasy league and you're not concerned about that kind of stuff, I mean, you just look at the stats, you don't necessarily think about how who the player is or anything like that, I think that you kind of have to say LaShawn McCoy has value, um, and I think draft him as basically a low-end RB2 at this point. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I stand on him. I, I stand on him being... Not a guy with RB1 upside. I think everybody below this um, that, that's higher up on the rankings does have RB1 upside, and I'm not sure he does, basically. So this is kind of a big tier jump up to number 19, and that is Kenyon Drake of the Miami Dolphins. 
Now, Kenny Drake's a guy that uh, basically took over that starting job uh, for Jay Ajayi once they traded him midseason. But what's weird is that Damian Williams actually got a significant number of touches. So uh, it wasn't like it was a smooth transition from Jay Ajayi directly into Kenny Drake being a beast running back. The team wasn't necessarily all that convinced that he was an elite back. So I do have a little bit of concern about that, especially now that they brought in Frank Gore. I don't have Frank Gore ranked in my top 50, but I think Frank Gore is going to take some touches uh, from Kenny and Drake, and there is some concern about that. He could potentially end up being their, their goal line back. He has scored some touchdowns throughout his career. So there is that possibility, and, and Miami's offense is probably not going to be all that great. So we don't want a running back that's going to be splitting touches and not a great offense. If they're going to be not a great offense, we want him to get all the carries, like LaShawn McCoy is potentially going to. Uh, so, you know, keep that stuff in mind, guys. I think that he does have great upside, though. The talent is there for him to be a low-end RB1 this season. Uh, number 18, or let's see, yeah, number 18, Royce Freeman of the Denver Broncos. Now, I think Royce Freeman has the possibility of being the second-best rookie in this entire draft class for the 2018 season, at least. I think long-term, I wouldn't put him there. But at the same time, the opportunity is here. I think Royce Freeman has serious potential to put up low-end RB1 option or low-end RB1 fantasy points, but I think he's pretty safe as an RB2 because of that workload. I don't think Devontae Booker is going to get significant touches. If he does, it'll probably just be a couple of weeks before they're like, oh, Royce Freeman is clearly the better player. Let's just give him all the carries. And I think that's probably what's going to happen fairly early in the season, week three, week four, week five. Uh, and even before that, I still think he's going to get the most touches out of this Denver backfield. Uh, I do think Denver's offense is going to be improved from what it was last year. The guys are going to be healthier. They have a better quarterback now. Um, I, I think that there's some serious upside with Royce Freeman, and I like him a lot. I like him better than most people do. Uh, there aren't many people that are going to see are going to have Royce Freeman ranked ahead of where I currently have him here at number 18, uh, and I'm fine with that. I think he's safe, and I think he's going to be good. Number 17, Jay Ajayi. He's shaky, but he has a great opportunity. Uh, I think that he has a good opportunity to be a very good fantasy running back this year because he's in that Philadelphia offense. Um, the talent is, I don't know. I really don't know. I want to say he's good, but at the same time, he hasn't really shown it on a consistent basis. And there's always that concern of those knees. Uh, there's a lot of concern here with Jay Ajayi, but that offense is good enough to produce an RB1 this season. If Jay Ajayi ends up being in every down or you know, if he gets 60% of the touches out of that backfield, uh, is 60 to 70 percent of the touches out of that backfield he is going to be an rb1 i don't think there's any question about that he has top five upside if that happens so seriously concern should be there about him but at the same time the upside is so good a lot of people are putting him on their like do not draft lists and i don't see that um i, I think he's going to have value this season so uh to me i think he's he's worth drafting where he's going basically and i have him ranked at 17th at 16 i have alex collins of the baltimore ravens um, you know, I think he's kind of similar to Royce Freeman right now as far as, like, I don't have a whole lot of concern about anyone else in that backfield taking significant carries. Uh, I did have, uh, you know, Ke Kenneth Dixon all the way down at 50th. He was the first guy on this list that I talked about. Um, uh, but that's basically just kind of one of those things where if he doesn't perform well, then I, I think that Kenneth Dixon could get carries. But early in the season, I don't see any reason why Alex Collins won't continue to be that bell cow type of running back, getting 15 to 20 touches a week. And there's so much value in that, especially in a, in a league where almost every single backfield throughout the league is a split backfield of some sort. At number 15, Jordan Howard. Um, obviously, he's a guy that has performed pretty well throughout his career so far. Um, but at the same time, he doesn't have a huge upside because he doesn't catch a lot of passes. So they do have Tariq Cohen for that, but he is a safe option, I think. Uh, there's not really a lot of concern that Tariq Cohen's going to take over that job as an every down back, so it'd be very, very difficult for him to lose his job, even if he's not overly productive, and I think he's going to be good enough in this offense. I think the offense is going to be better, so yeah, I mean, 15th I think is pretty fair for him in a PPR. At number 14, Jarek McKinnon of the San Francisco 49ers got that huge contract, and I'm expecting that they're going to use him very heavily this season. The guy is super, super, super talented, uh, but he hasn't necessarily performed at a consistent level throughout his career so far, and uh, so there is concern, con some concern with him. Uh, that's why he's not ranked higher on my list, uh, but as far as physical talent goes, I don't know that there are 10 running backs in the league that have more physical talent than Jarek McKinnon, and he's in a good offense. This offense, at least the system, is set up in such a way that he should be able to perform. Carlos Hyde was a good PPR back last year. Think about that. Carlos Hyde was a good PPR back. Jerick McKinnon is 
a way better receiver than Carlos Hyde. He may not be as good of a between-the-tackles runner, but that PPR value, I think, will make it so that his floor is high enough that drafting him here at number 14, I think, is going to be valuable. At number 13, Joe Mixon. I'm super high on Joe Mixon this season. I think that he is going to be a guy who could potentially win your league for you. This is a guy to put a star next to. Don't draft him in the first round, but I think drafting him near the second, at the end of the second round or early third round is a very good option. Uh, he is a guy that you could potentially see finishing as a top five fantasy running back if, if Cincinnati's offense improves this year. Yes, he was not good as a rookie last year. I, I will openly admit that, but the talent is there. And this offensive line is going to be better. The offense should be healthier as a whole. I think that they're just going to be a better team this season. And I think that that's going to rub off on Joe Mixon. He should be a guy who gets plenty of touches this year. Yes, Gio Bernard is still going to get his touches. But Joe Mixon is a great receiving running back. Just because Gio is a good run, receiving running back does not mean that he's just going to be in there every passing down. Joe Mixon is probably, I don't know, out of the guys that are not just like the, the obvious pass catching backs, like, you know, the Tariq Cohens or the uh, Theo Riddicks, those type of guys, Duke Johnsons, of the guys that are kind of the more, um, you know, all around backs, I think Joe Mixon is probably one of the top guys in the league who can do it all. The talent is there. The talent is there. So bank on that talent, bank on the opportunity, and I think that Cincinnati is going to give him plenty of opportunities this year to be a fantasy RB1, and you don't have to draft him there. You don't have to draft him as a fantasy RB1, but I think he has RB1 upside, so I really like Joe Mixon. At number 12, Devonta Freeman. Uh, you know, every every year we keep hearing about how Devonta Freeman is going to fall off, but every year he still performs at uh, somewhere between a low-end RB1 to a high-end RB1 and I think that that's likely to continue here. I have him at ranked at number 12, which is a low-end RB1. And, uh, you know, the, the PPR value is there. He's a guy that they have locked up in a long-term contract. So I don't think he's going anywhere. He's going to remain a part of that offense. He's the better back between he and Tevin Coleman. So there's not a lot of concern there. Um, I think Atlanta's offense two seasons ago was so good that everybody was disappointed in what Devontae Freeman did last year. But at the same time, he was still a pretty solid fantasy back. He was a guy that you could rely on. And I, I think that the offense is going to be somewhere between what it was last year and two years ago. Two years ago was unsustainably good, and I think last year was too far of a regression back. So I expect them to improve at least a little bit this season, and I think that that's going to help Devonta Freeman. He's going to be a good guy that you can rely on. If you wait on running back just a little bit, he can be your low-end RB1 uh, or your high-end RB2, and I think you're going to be pretty happy with that. At number 11, Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings. There is concern that Latavius Murray is going to get some touches in this backfield, but I think Dalvin Cook proved last year in the short time that he was on the field that he is the better back between the two of them, and he's the more physically talented back as far as like overall ability goes. He can catch passes. He can do a lot. But there are concerns about injuries with Dalvin Cook, so that's something to keep in mind. At the same time, though, I still think I would draft him as a low-end RB1, so uh, I'm not, I must not be too concerned about it, I guess. Number 10, Christian McCaffrey, PPR monster. Obviously, this is a guy that has 100 catch upside, and uh, he's probably the best pass catching running back in the entire NFL. There are a lot of people that believe in Carolina that he's going to get more carries this season. He had a right around 100 carries last year. People are talking about potentially 200 carries for him. I'm going to split the difference and call it 150. And if he gets 150 and he hovers around 90 catches, there's almost no way that he doesn't finish as an RB1 this season in PPR leagues. He does have potential to break off big plays. The one thing is that, obviously, like I talked about, Cam Newton's kind of their goal line back, so I don't expect 10 touchdowns out of McCaffrey. But if he gets, let's say, five rushing carry touchdowns uh, and maybe three receiving touchdowns, something like that. If he gets eight touchdowns on the year, catches 90 passes and rushes for, I don't know, 700 yards or something along those lines, I think he's got enough value there that he's going to be very, very good as an RB1. Uh, the floor is super high with him. That's always valuable. Um, he doesn't have ceiling to be the RB1 in my personal opinion, but at the same time, I think that he still has the, the upside to be a pretty solid mid-level RB1, and that's kind of where I've got him ranked here at number 10. Uh, Kareem Hunt at number 9. I've kind of waffled between putting him at 10 and Christian McCaffrey at 9 and, and he at 9 and Christian McCaffrey at 10. But what I've kind of settled on is that I just think Kareem Hunt's workload is more likely. Uh, Kareem Hunt is a guy who's a good receiving back as well. He's not as good as Christian McCaffrey, but uh, he should be good enough, I think, to get at least like 50 catches this year. And he's going to get a lot more carries than Christian McCaffrey. And he's going to be their goal line back. I'm not concerned at all about Spencer Ware, guys. Yeah, Spencer Ware was good two years ago, but who cares? Kareem Hunt was the 
one of the best players that we had in fantasy last year. He won people a lot of money in fantasy football last year, and I don't see any reason why that's going to change. Um, Patrick Mahomes, I don't think, is necessarily a huge drop-off from Alex Smith uh, for a guy like Kareem Hunt, at least. I think that the there's not going to be a lot of difference for him specifically. There might be for the receivers, though. Uh, but for Kareem Hunt, I think it remains relatively similar. Uh, if anything, the, the defenses might have to move back a little bit just because they're concerned that he's going to sling it over the top on them. So uh, there might be some positive value there, actually, for Patrick Mahomes in that backfield. But um, either way, I think Kareem Hunt is a pretty safe RB this season. Uh, I don't have him as like a top five guy, even though he finished there last year, just because I like some other guys ahead of him a little bit better. But he's still pretty safe. At number eight, Leonard Fournette of the Jaguars. This is a guy who has like 350 carry upside. Honestly, the, the backfield there is not overly talented. TJ Yeldon is going to be their pass catching guy. But at the same time, almost nobody else has an opportunity to get more than 50 carries this year in that backfield. So Leonard Fournette's a guy that has some serious upside. Uh, if things break well for him, if Blake Bortles somehow decides that he's a decent NFL player, uh, he's, Leonard Fournette has the possibility to put in double digit touchdowns, you know, 1,500 yards rushing. I mean, he's probably still going to catch 40 passes minimum, I would say. So I, I 35 maybe at minimum and, you know, 50-something upside-wise. So he does have the ability to catch passes. It's not like he's completely incompetent like a Jordan Howard as a pass catcher. So I, I like Leonard Fournette a little bit better than that type of player, and that's why I've got him ranked here at number eight. Uh, Melvin Gordon is my number seven running back of the Chargers. Now, uh, the workload, workload for Melvin Gordon is super, super high. He's one of the guys that could potentially lead the league in touches this year at the running back position. He's a good receiving back. He's a good running back. Um, he basically does it all. Uh, goal line back as well. So there's not a lot of concern with him. Uh, he does have RB1 overall upside. I don't think that the Chargers offense is going to be quite good enough to get him there. But at the same time, I would be surprised if he stays healthy this season and he doesn't finish as an RB1. So he's super safe, and I love that in round one. Uh, and, and if you can get him in round two, man, that's even better. So uh, number six, Alvin Kamara of the New Orleans Saints. We talked a little bit about him earlier. I think there's a possibility that he holds off Mark Ingram this year and ends up being kind of their, not necessarily their bell cow, because I do think uh, that uh, Ingram's still going to get touches. But at the same time, I think that Alvin Kamara is going to fight and get a bigger share of those touches. He was an RB1 last year. The efficiency has to drop. There's no way he keeps up doing what he did last year, but I think that he could potentially accumulate the same type of stats just on more touches. So, uh, you know, again, don't expect him to set NFL records for efficiency again, but definitely I think with that increased workload, he's got the possibility to finish as a mid-level RB1. Uh, and I think low end, his, his downside is basically like high-end RB2, mid-level RB2 at the very, very worst if he stays healthy. So there's not a lot of concern with taking him here in the top six or so. At number five, Saquon Barkley. Um, I just, I think this guy might be the best, most talented physical beast of a running back that I have ever seen come into the NFL draft. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be LaDainian Tomlinson on day one, but the physical talent is insane with this guy. He's a pass-catching back that's on the level of a Christian McCaffrey, but he's also a between-the-tackles runner, and he has explosive speed, and he's just a monster of a human being in terms of just physical size. The strength is ridiculous. Everything that you would look for in a running back is in Saquon Barkley. And so to me, with there not being really any competition in the New York backfield, I think he's super, super safe to finish as an RB1. I, I don't see any world where he doesn't finish as an RB1 if he stays healthy. And so to me, I get it. He's a rookie. We've quote unquote never seen it. But if you want to be the guy that says, I've never seen it before, I can't draft him, fine. Don't draft him. Fine. Let everybody else reap that benefit of drafting a guy that has this type of ability. If you said that last year about Kareem Hunt, if you said that last year about Alvin Kamara, although Alvin Kamara was undrafted in most leagues, but if you said that about those types of running backs in the past, if you said it about you know a lot of guys that, that have broken out recently at running back, it happens every year. There are beast running backs that are drafted every year. Dalvin Cook last year for a short time before he got hurt. I mean, it's name after name after name. These guys get drafted early, and they perform. Even Trent Richardson, who is terrible, was given the opportunity in Cleveland, and he finished as an RB1 in his rookie season. Saquon Barkley is a way better player than Trent Richardson. There is almost, like I said, no possibility that he doesn't finish as an RB1 this season if he stays healthy. At number four, I do have Ezekiel Elliott now. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I am concerned about Ezekiel Elliott right now. I, I am a Dallas Cowboys fan, if you guys don't know, and there is serious concern right now in this offensive line. Travis Frederick is 
hurt. He is not going to play this season. I'm, I'm basically saying this guy's not going to play this season. That's maybe the best center in the NFL. Probably the best center in the NFL. And so without having him, Zach Martin's nursing an injured leg. He's probably going to play in week one, but is he going to be at 100%? I don't think so. Trent or uh, uh, Tyron Smith at left tackle is finally healthy, which is great. But now the two interior guys are hurt. This is not a good situation. Dallas's passing game is trash. They have almost nobody to throw the ball to. Defenses are going to stack the box. It, it doesn't look like a good situation for Ezekiel Elliott. There are a lot of potential bad things that could happen for Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, the efficiency may be substantially down this season from what it was in his past two seasons. I'm concerned. But at the same time, I think Ezekiel Elliott has a possibility to touch the ball 400 times this season. Seriously. And 300, I think, is his floor if he stays healthy. So if a guy touches the ball at least 300 times, it only takes him four yards per touch, which would be almost impossible for him to not accomplish that. I'm, I'm talking per touch, keep in mind, guys. So not just per carry. I'm, you know, you have to add in the receptions as well, and those are typically going to be six, seven, eight yards per reception. Um, so that bumps up that average overall. But if, if he just has four yards per touch, which would be terrible, by the way, that would be such a low number, he still has 1,200 total yards. And Dallas runs the ball at the goal line all the time. He's a guy that has 12, 15 touchdown upside. If the offensive line does come together and Travis Frederick does somehow get on the field and Zach Martin's healthy, this guy has the possibility of being the RB1. But he does also have the possibility of finishing outside of the RB1s, um, depending on how things break. So, you know, I, I think if he doesn't get the touchdowns, if the offense isn't good, even if he gets 1,200 total yards, uh, he might miss the RB1 cut. And so I've kind of gone back and forth actually today about moving Saquon Barkley ahead of him and putting Ezekiel Elliott at number five. But I think I'm going to stick with, with my guns on this one. I think Ezekiel Elliott does have the talent to overcome it, at least to some extent. And the usage is going to be so ridiculous that I, I just don't see any way that he doesn't finish as at least a low-end RB1. So, uh, you know, to me, I, I think he's fairly safe, but I am a little concerned still. Uh, number three, David Johnson is coming back from the wrist injury last year. A lot of people don't really realize that that was the injury that knocked him out for the season. They just think, oh, season ender, so it was probably a knee or an ankle or something along those lines. No, it was a wrist injury, and it's not something to be concerned about. So that's good. This is good news because this is a guy who didn't take any sort of damage last year from linebackers or anything like that. He had a full season now. He's had an entire 365 days to get healthy. So I, I love that. I love that this guy is going to be fully healthy coming into the season, and he's going to be ready to take a huge workload just like Ezekiel Elliott. But I don't think he's going to get quite as many touches just because Arizona's offense isn't really built like that. At the same time, though, he's going to catch more passes. He could potentially catch 80, 90 passes again this season. Um, there's you know double-digit touchdown upside. The last time that we saw him play a full healthy season, he scored, what, 20 touchdowns? I mean, he was the RB1. He's a stud as a, pro, as a player, and I don't have a whole lot of concern about him, even though that Arizona offense might be pretty trash this year. Uh, he's still going to touch the ball so much that I just don't have much of a concern about it. Number two, Todd Gurley. Touchdowns have to regress. There's no way he's going to score 20-something touchdowns again, even in a good offense, and I, I expect their offense to be good again. But Todd Gurley is just, a, he's like a better version of Ezekiel Elliott, basically, as far as fantasy goes, because he's going to get a huge workload, and he's also in a better offense, and he's a better pass catcher. So he's got a couple different things working for him. I don't think there's much of a concern about Gurley. Uh, worst case scenario, he's a low-end RB1. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a great value at taking him in your top three. And if he slips lower than that, just take him. Do not be worried about it. Le'Veon Bell, same type of situation. I'm not concerned about the holdout. I think he'll be there in week one. I think he's holding out a preseason because he doesn't want to hurt his stock. And I don't blame him because if he hurt himself in the preseason, that's not good for the, the contract that he's going to be looking for next season. So, uh, to me, I'm not concerned about that. He's going to be there. He doesn't want to cause a stink, and he doesn't want to look like a player who's not willing to go out there and play. So uh, to me, I think he's going to be out there, and I, like I said, not concerned about it, and just he's a stud running back. He's top three every year. I'm, I'm totally not worried about Le'Veon Bell. It might be a little bit of a slow start to the season just because he hasn't been there working with the team. He may be not completely up to speed, but at the same time, it's Le'Veon Bell, guys. He's a beast. He did that last year, too, and we're 
we're totally fine with it. So there you have it, guys. That is my top 50 running backs. I know this is a long video, but I do appreciate it. We kind of want to do this in kind of almost like a podcast type of format where I just run it down for you, and it's a long video. I get it. So if you stuck around to the end, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like on it and subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'm going to be putting out, again, the running backs, the uh, wide receivers, the tight ends, uh, and the quarterbacks here on the, in the next couple, couple of days, probably on Friday, I would guess, uh, you're going to see at least two of those come out. Maybe on Saturday we'll put on another one. Uh, and then I'm also going to do sleepers, busts, and all kinds of different other content here over the next couple of weeks to get you prepared for your fantasy drafts. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to drop them in the comments section below if you have them. Otherwise, make sure you follow me on Twitter, at ClickWithTV. I will leave a link to that in the description below, and you guys can go over there and check that out. You can ask me questions on there. And also make sure that you check out the Google document that I placed in the description below. That is my full rankings for all the positions. That's what you're going to see on the video anyway, but I'm going to give you a rundown of why I believe that these players are where they are in the video. So if you're interested in that, stick around and check out those next videos as well. Thanks again, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to stop on by again this week, and we'll have more content for you. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you guys again soon.